it's really is a pleasure to um, welcome uh, Thomas, or we go by Tad Homer Dixon. Um, this is part of a discussion that really illuminates our strategic planning process as we think about what's happening in the world around us and really some of the big changes. And the big changes, in many cases, interconnected. Um, we want to put that in the context when we think about where we're going as a school. Um, and in that regard, there's probably nobody who could find who would be better suited to look at some of the, the real interesting big pictures and the interconnections. Uh, so Thomas is a, is a professor at the Belsilly School. Um, he's also a research chair at the University of Waterloo. His research uh, should also indicate that he has a strong connection to Victoria. So he's originally from here. And it's great to have him back. Um, but if you look at where his research is focused on and the kind of things that we've been talking about and what kind of role of business should play in society. So far, focused on threats to global security, including economic instability, climate change, energy scarcity, and, uh, and also how people, organizations, and societies can better resolve conflicts and innovate in this world. Now, those themes resonate pretty closely to the things that we've been talking about. So it's really a, it's a pleasure to welcome him to what will be a really powerful engagement. So, thank you for coming. Uh, it, it's marvelous to be here. Every time I come back to you, Vic, it is it's truly coming home. I started my undergraduate education here in the 19th yikes, 1970s. Uh, of course, the business school didn't exist in those days. Uh, it's been wonderful to see the university develop over all those years and, and flourish the way it has. Uh, of course, the world has changed a lot, too, in some pretty profound ways, and we'll be talking a bit about those changes today. Uh, as Sol was suggesting, my, I'm not a I'm not a business or management person. I haven't been trained in those disciplines. My fields are political science, a bit of economics, but really I call myself a complex systems guy. I think about the, the uh, nature of complex systems, both natural and social, economic and political systems, for example. Uh, but nonetheless, our interests do overlap a great deal. I'm interested in how societies respond to complex stresses. I'm interested in the nature of growth and the nature of innovation, and especially the kind of interface or the interaction between the natural world and the social world. To what extent uh, is the natural world and natural forces coming out of that world going to be increasingly important uh, this in coming decades, going forward this century, and what kinds of challenges for our society will, will those uh, natural pressures exert or create for our societies? So that's where I'm going to start. Uh, I call this the age of nature, and I think for a long time there's been this assumption that human beings could uh, especially modern capitalist democratic societies with the enormous power of science behind them, modern science, could somehow uh, subordinate nature or put it to one side uh, if there were problems that arose from resource scarcity or, or environmental stresses, those could be addressed through technological change and through the power of markets. Uh, I'm going to argue today over the next few minutes that, uh, that we're going to get a rude awakening in this century, that nature is going to is going to come back in a very forceful way into our uh, public affairs, into our economies, into our even intimately into our lives, as you'll see. So I'm going to spend a bit of time just going through uh, what I regard as some of these big uh, material forces that are related to sort of uh, human uh, biological nature, uh, economic metabolism. Uh, and effects on the natural environment. And one of the most important places to start, of course, is with uh, demographic pressure. Uh, there's a new book out that you may have heard of by uh, Daryl Bricker and John Ibbotson uh, titled Empty Planet that suggests that we're uh, it, approaching a stage where there's going to be a dramatic decline in the human population. I've had an extended conversation with both of them over the last couple of weeks. I think the argument is, how to put it politely, substantially nonsense. Uh, the United Nations projects, and they're very good demographers within the United Nations, that uh, we will probably see at least 10 billion people on this planet uh, by 2100. 
whereas if, uh, about two decades ago, they suggested that uh, we would see a peak in human population sometime this century in eight, around eight to nine billion. Now, largely because of slower fertility declines in uh, West Asia and in Africa, uh, they're suggesting that it's quite likely, according to the median prediction, that human population will continue to increase through this century. Uh, but the really important story about demographic pressure is not, is not uh, the overall increase in human prop population. It's the, it's the imbalances in demographic growth and population growth between different regions of the world that will drive very large-scale migrations, especially when coupled with environmental damage in some of the heavily populated parts of the world. Uh, just to give you a very quick sense, this is the uh, population projection for Europe going forward. Uh, even in the median projection, we're seeing a peak and a decline. If, uh, if fertility declines faster, you could see an absolute, you know, a real collapse in European population going out towards the end of the century. And then you look at Africa, which is right next door. Uh, Africa's population is going to triple in the next 50 years. And you just want to repeat that. Africa's population is going to triple from 1.25 billion to about 3.5 to 3.75 billion in the next 50 years. And that's in a continent that is already under enormous political and social stress and enormous environmental stress. Uh, the kinds of migration pressures that we've seen from Africa into Europe are going to, are going to increase probably by orders of magnitude in the, coming, uh, in the coming decades, simply because of this demographic imbalance. I could point, point to other places in the world where we're seeing a similar demographic imbalance, uh, not quite as pronounced as this one. But uh, that's really the issue. It's not so much the overall size of the human population, it's the unequal growth rates in different parts of the world. Uh, uh, another important part of this kind of overall demographic transition is the rapid urbanization of the human population. You're probably very familiar with this. It's received a lot of attention over the last few years. Uh, uh, not too long ago, depending on when you calculate and the kind of statistics you use, but in the last 10 years, we saw the human urban population exceed the human rural population. Uh, as you can see from this chart, going out into the future, the difference between the size of the urban population and the rural population is really quite pronounced, remarkably pronounced. This is going to be a fundamental feature of human societies going forward. And it has all kinds of consequences for social organization, for economies, uh, for, for business, for management, of course. It also has huge consequences for uh, uh, ideological polarization, because as we've seen around the world, there's a very stark gap, usually, between the uh, ideological positions of folks living in rural areas compared to those living in urban areas. It's one of the most striking divisions in the world, and a very, very powerful uh, force behind political polarization, especially in Western societies. So I'm going to spend a bit of time on climate change, because I think that it really is the the potential deal breaker for the human species. And the science has, I've worked on this issue for 30 years, and the science that's coming in on climate change, unfortunately, on almost a daily basis now, is, it paints a very grim picture of what, of what we're looking at. I can't I cover the whole issue here in just a couple of minutes. Um, it's always a bit odd talking about global warming when we have an anomalously cold day, <laughs> which actually, having grown up in Victoria, is not anomalously cold. It's only because our baselines have changed. I just want to point that out. But, but uh, um, if there's some interest in the Q&A, I can go over what some of the latest science on the issue of the destabilizing, destabilization of the polar vortex, which uh, seems to be causing these extraordinary swings in temperature uh, Chicago, within two days, had a swing of 73 degrees Fahrenheit. In my part of Ontario, we had a swing of 30 degrees Celsius in two days. And there's a, there is a, an emerging theory about what's happening in the Arctic and the temperate latitudes uh, with the jet streams and things that suggests that this is probably related to the loss of sea ice in the Arctic. But that I won't talk about right at this point. What I want to, to go over just quickly is, is just the magnitude of the change we're going to see, impressionistically, the magnitude of the change we're going to see this, uh, this century. Uh, this chart haunts me. Uh, I published it in the Globe and Mail with uh, one of my graduate students, Jonathan Strauch, this, uh, this past summer. Uh, it, is an, it is an updated version of the uh, infamous hockey stick graph, which, by the way, is grounded in very solid science. 
This is what you might call a hockey stick graph on steroids. So this case, we're looking back at, uh, at uh, uh, average surface temperature in the planet uh, to the, uh, from the end of the last ice age to the present. So this is the Holocene epoch, and then most recently the Anthropocene epoch, which we would date to probably, depending on various factors, probably somewhere around 1880 or so. Some people date it from 1950. Um, but uh, the most important thing here, and I should point out that, that zero degrees is normalized, as you can see at the top there, uh, is the average temperature from 1961 to 1990. Uh, and we've seen since the 1880s about 1.1 degree of warming from there to there. Uh, but the most important thing is that during this long period of time, uh, the variation in average surface temperature in the planet was uh, was about 0 0.7 degrees. And during the last 2,000 years, when humankind laid down its infrastructure of, of modern civilization, its major cities, uh, its ports, more recently, its uh, agricultural zones, its irrigation systems, transportation infrastructure, uh, the variation was about 0 0.5 degrees. And we are already substantially outside that envelope. And this is where we're going this century, and we are very unlikely to stop at two degrees, given the current emission trajectories. And, uh, and so this, this possibility of getting to three degrees is a, is a very live possibility this century. Uh, radically outside the envelope of temperatures within which human civilization developed. And that's very important. It's Steve, Stefan Ramsdorf, who's a uh, uh, a senior climate scientist in Germany pointed out, by the end of this century, Earth will be unrecognizable with this temperature change. Earth will be unrecognizable. Now, unfortunately, the story doesn't end there because there is increasing concern about the possibility of self-reinforcing feedbacks in the climate system. And these have been discussed for long periods of time, things like large-scale releases of methane from the, from the um, permafrost when it starts to melt. Uh, from <clears throat> clathrate ice that's under the, under the seabed in the Arctic regions. Um, there are a number of possible feedbacks like that. <clears throat> and we haven't really had a good sense of when they might kick in and how powerful they would be. But some of the more recent research says that they could actually start to operate much uh, sooner than has been thought possible. And this paper appeared in this last summer, got a great deal of attention. It was actually uh, on the front page in the New York Times. Uh, and, uh, and in it, they, these authors, some of whom I've worked with, uh, uh, identify a series of what they call tipping elements. These are basically feedbacks that can, positive feedbacks, self-reinforcing feedbacks that can kick in at various temperatures from one to three degrees Celsius, three to five, over five degrees Celsius. And, uh, and, and pointed out that some of these feedbacks probably will themselves reinforce each other. We'll get into the details, but this science is emerging quite quickly, and it suggests that it suggests that uh, uh, if we get to three degrees, we might not stop there. That actually beyond three degrees, we get into a zone where we slide inexorably to five, six, seven degrees. And uh, and at that point, I mean, if we get to five or six degrees, it is just game over for human civilization. And we can't feed ten billion people on this planet with, a, a, uh, with a, a climate that warms five or six degrees. Large swaths of the planet would have to be abandoned to human habitation. There will be um, very <clears throat> significant parts of the planet where the average temperature for significant parts of the year uh, is above 30, 37 degrees Celsius, wet bulb temperature, which is the maximum temperature that a human being can sustain outdoors uh, uh, because in, through through um, perspiration, just keeping their bodies cool enough to survive. And so those zones will not be habitable over long periods of time. So that includes most of the Gulf region, tropical, tropical areas of Africa, a lot of the Gangetic Basin in, uh, in India, very significant zones with very large populations. So this, this in the same article pointed out that this, we, we really are in a situation where we're at the cusp of, of perhaps having some kind of runaway warming on the planet that could happen much sooner than was recognized uh, even as recently as a decade ago. So the challenge is, 
is really grave. We don't know if this is right, but even to my mind, it's a Pascal's wager kind of problem. Uh, if you've got even a 10% chance of this being an outcome, you've got to do everything you can to avoid it. Uh, and I think it's substantially higher than 10%. So um, extreme climate events, of course, are what we're starting to see now, and we don't have to go through these in much detail. Uh, and sometimes in my talks, I talk about the underlying mechanisms behind extreme climate events. Uh, in Q&A, we could discuss some of this, but we're all familiar with the images. People are becoming much more aware of this now in their daily lives. Uh, one of the interesting phenomena in the United States is that uh, Trump's presidency seems to have boosted across the ideological spectrum uh, a recognition that climate change is a serious problem and that human beings are causing it. This is now running, uh, uh, running um, 73 percent of the American population are, is now worried about climate change, and something like 60 percent thinks that human beings are the main cause. And that's a, it's a 10-point jump in the last year or something. Very substantial change. So we can talk about, again, the underlying mechanisms. There's, it doesn't look like hurricanes are becoming more frequent, but the big ones, they're more really big ones that pack a, a huge punch and, of course, do enormous amounts of damage. And then the fires, the fires we've experienced here. I've been here the last two summers. And you know, my dad was a forester. He, he was the chief forester for the Greater Victoria Water District. And I used to fight fires with him when I, when I was a kid. And uh, just before he passed away, it was the first big smoke event in BC in, in 2015. I don't even know if you remember. It actually started in June. And uh, uh, or yeah, it was, it, was, it was early July, I think, July the 8th or something. Anyway, and he, I asked him, I said, have you ever seen anything like this before? And he said, no. Now he's, he was 89, right? Spent his life out here. These things are new. And they're, and they're important in ways that I think uh, uh, help us frame these issues normatively in a, in, a, in a powerful way that can be useful within business schools and with management schools. <clears throat> And there's a relationship between a lot of these stresses and some of the geopolitical instabilities we're seeing in the world, the population pressures, the climate pressures. For instance, in the case of Syria, there is an argument to be made, quite a strong argument, that a drought in the country around 20, 2009 to 2011 affected very powerfully the food output in the northern part of the country, which caused about a million people to migrate into the cities in Syria. And there's some evidence that those are the places where the, the revolt started to break out first, right? Now, there's a big debate, which I'm following very closely because this is one of my, my fields, the uh, connections between environmental stress and violent conflict. Uh, <clears throat> but you can, you can say that we, there is a set of connections. I don't think, here's what I, the way I would put it, I don't think you can understand what happened in Syria in terms of the background causal mechanisms adequately, all the way up to the rise of, of the Islamic State without taking into consideration that drought. You don't have a full, full causal explanation. So that leaves open the question of what, what contribution it made. Uh, but I think you can arguably say it was substantial. And of course, this violence in Syria caused huge migrations of folks. Uh, they were coming from other places too, but substantially from Syria into Europe which, which uh, was one of the factors that has shaken the European Union and the institutions in the European Union to the core in the last half dozen years and in, all, the, all the way through to the, to the uh, vote to the Brexit folk in the U UK. So the last uh, issue that I'm going to talk about that I think uh, is a part of this story, uh, this complex story of social stresses, and this is less natural or material and, and more, uh, in a sense, purely economic, although I think there's also a material component, is whether we're seeing a, a long-term shift in growth rates in, our, in, in especially advanced economies. And uh, I'm, I find very interesting the work of Robert Gordon. Most of you are probably familiar with Robert Gordon's work, and he looks at the uh, the, the possibility that we're reverting to long-term growth rates that are actually quite low. The long-term growth rates in, uh, 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 in the UK and the US you know, averaged around 0.25%, and then we had a burst of higher growth that was associated with a whole suite of technologies developed in the 19th and 20th centuries uh, that were uh, technologies that uh, uh, where capital complemented labor and didn't, instead of uh, supplanting labor. 
and so uh, produced a burst of consumption, demand, and, and increasing personal productivity, labor productivity, and enormous amounts of growth. And he suggests that in looking out to the future, you can't see technologies that have that character going forward. Most of the new technologies are going to be labor displacing, it looks like, uh, for the most part. Um, autonomous vehicles, for example, robotics, AI. Uh, and in addition, you have a set of what he calls six headwinds. Uh, you're all familiar with these uh, that uh, are going to incrementally uh, reduce whatever growth there is in the economy from technological change and increase on productivity in the future. Uh, he includes this. In particular, he's interested in increasing energy costs. And I added environmental costs here because I think the, the load of climate change will become substantial economically. We're going to be investing increasingly in adaptation and, and mitigation measures and coping with the costs from things like wildfires and and uh, droughts, and uh, that will divert resources away from productivity enhancing investments. He looks at uh, the growth rate, average growth rate from 1987 to 2007 uh, in the United States, and then he subtracts a reasonable estimate for each one of these headwinds, demography, education, inequality, globalization, energy. There's some issue about whether you can create this as an additive function here or not. But in the end, he gets back to a, a growth rate that is more or less uh, uh, similar to the historical average of about 0.25%. I'll come back to that issue in a, in a few minutes because I think this issue of declining growth rates and the issue of, of growth more generally is a profoundly important normative question for all of us and for business schools as well. This com complex set of events, I would argue, is, is contributing to what we see now as a, what I call a politics of fear. I emphasize this in the book I'm working on right now, which, believe it or not, is a book about hope. <laughs> which is enormously hard to write about at the moment. <laughs> but the trick is, the trick, I mean, is, is, is reconciling honesty with hope, like taking these problems seriously and, and, and being honest about how, how serious they are and how they create boundary conditions for our future, uh, uh, and then seeing some opportunity and possibilities for hope in that. And, uh, and certainly, uh, the anger that we're seeing in our political systems and the exploitation of that anger uh, is something that can produce a kind of uh, downward spiral, a, a, a positive feedback, but in the bad direction, where you get uh, political polarization, social breakdown, which affect growth, and that, of course, affects employment and worsens political polarization and social breakdown. And the, the, the consequences of this politics of fear are things like building barriers. Uh, uh, Sol and I were talking about this earlier. Uh, physical barriers to migrants along the Texas-Mexican border. Uh, institutional barriers. We're all familiar with this. And the rise of uh, political extremism. And we're, you know, I would say that liberal democracies are fighting a rearguard action against this right now. And uh, we all know where it's happening and we're all very concerned about uh, about this virus becoming more entrenched in our societies. So what should we do? So I'm, this part of the talk really is broken into two parts. The first about the opportunities that are available to us because I think they're huge. This is a period of really creative destruction in a broad scale and the creating opportunities for profit and opportunities for new kinds of entrepreneurship, new, new economic activities, new economic forms. And then, this, and then I'll close, close with a few comments on the issue of license and the normative questions that arise as we move forward. What kind of social license do we have? How can we create that social license? And how do, how do business schools and management schools situate themselves in this radically different world? So the first thing I want to point out is that we're, we're a, approaching something like a general purpose technology transition, although with a twist. We've seen these transitions before. Railroads, electricity, internal combustion engine, personal computers. These are the things that, that uh, Gordon was talking about, Robert Gordon was talking about in his work. 
And in each case of each GPT pulse of technology that's gone through the, through the economy has produced a surge of growth. Enormous creative destruction, whole sectors, <coughs> industrial sectors have disappeared, new ones have been created. Uh, but they've all been associated with, in some sense, single technological innovations. Uh, and what we're looking at this century is a whole suite of technologies, and we don't really know how they're going to sort themselves out. I mean, it, it may be that we're going to have electric vehicles with uh, some kind of you know, advanced version of batteries, something beyond lithium ion, or we may be hydrogen. You know, it, it's possible hydrogen is still very competitive. Uh, we don't know exactly how these technologies are going to sort themselves out, but there's no question that the transition is coming. Because the impacts of extreme climate events and the impact on food production in the world will be sufficient enough that it's going to mobilize people, and I'll talk about this in a moment, mobilize people to demand from their leaders, do something about this. Uh, and, uh, and the transition on, in aggregate is affordable, uh, but there are focused costs that hit very powerful industries significantly, and, and, and they become blocking coalitions to to change, as we're seeing. But there's no question that on, on an aggregate, we can do this without wrecking our economies. Uh, in fact, it, there might actually be enormous economic benefits in various ways. And the transition can happen a lot faster than people realize. It's one of my central arguments here. So this is Toronto. I spent quite a bit of time searching for these photos. Uh, Toronto, there's Flatiron Building in 1890s. You see the horses and buggies. You know, and there's some more. This is the 1890s. So here we are, 20, 20 years later, right? And this is in an age when technological innovation proceeded at a fraction of the pace that, we're, that we see it in our societies today. So that's 1910. There's 1924. This is a 20 or 30 years. Horses disappeared. I think there's one horse there somewhere. Yes, right there. <laughs> so, so. Uh, you know, we set our minds to this. We can make this change happen very fast. Uh, and I think that there are, I've been really influenced by my doctoral student, Jonathan Strauch, on this, because I think there are interaction, self-reinforcing feedbacks within our economies that are starting to kick in. And not just economies narrowly, but social and political systems, too. And Jonathan emphasizes these three in particular. Uh, that they are enabling each other. The political mobilization around the climate issue and around the energy transition is, uh, is in enabling financial market pressures through things like divestment movements and concerns about stranded assets, uh, enabling investment in uh, new technologies that are driving down prices, which then turn in, because it, it, you prices for solar and wind, for example. And that, in turn, has influences on both the political mobilization and the financial markets. And one of the important things here is these three forces tend to be looked at in isolation from each other, but they're probably all operating simultaneously. Uh, the climate change issue is not going to go away as a political problem, as a social problem. Uh, it's coming up again in the Australian election. It's, it's going to be a big deal in the Australian election. It's going to be a big deal in the Canadian, coming Canadian election. The, the Democrats are organizing themselves around this, this question. It's, it's moving to front and center in politics in major societies. And even, even in places like India, it's, it's something that is understood as important by the mass of the population. And there is... It's mixed up, of course, with things like urban air pollution, but there's, there are political demands that something be done. And so the price changes are absolutely astonishing in uh, PV and solar, uh, solar PV and wind power. Um, so uh, on, on solar PV, uh, David Keith, you may know him, he's at the university, he's Canadian, he was at the University of Calgary, and now he's at Harvard. About uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, he did a kind of Delphi survey of experts around the world. He's very well connected. He asked everybody who was considered, who's considered a leading expert in technological energy technology change, and he asked them for their estimates. I think this was probably 15 years ago. Asked them for their projections of future declines or price changes in PV solar, and none of them came close to what happened in terms of the. And this is this is with conventional technology. This is just, this is scale effects. This is just ramping up production and squeezing out efficiencies in your, in your production. And it's been driven, I mean, we know, substantially by China. 
but it actually started with German subsidies to wind and solar that created a sufficient market that there was incentives for, for companies to start innovating and getting to scale and developing scale effects and pricing. So this is the, the International Energy Agency 2017. This is, these folks are not known for being tremendously bullish on renewables and, uh, and pointing out that, and you look at the difference in, in capacity additions uh, with renewables compared to, to others. And, and this is in an environment where we still have storage problems because renewables are intermittent and so there's an issue about whether you can actually uh, re rely on them for power without adequate storage. But the advances in the last two or three years on, on battery technology have been very impressive. And of course, Elon Musk is, uh, is, is, is developing huge battery factories and batteries that will be available at the household level, batteries that can power uh, towns and, and, and communities. Uh, and at that point, that evens out the deliverability of the wind and solar power, and you've got yourself baseload, which is very cool. There are issues with, with uh, solar and wind that, that limit their utility in some respects. We can talk about those in Q&A if you want. But um, Financial system pressures, uh, I think this is a real wild card. I know that Michael Byers spoke at the Victoria Forum a while ago. He was looking at the issue of attribution and liability, attribution of climate change damage, and then possible uh, court actions to, to, uh, to establish liability, corporate liability, for example, for uh, extreme weather events. He thinks that uh, there are uh, plausible routes through which these uh, costs can be attributed to corporations, especially overseas, and then those, those uh, uh, rulings, court rulings, could be applied, uh, for instance, beyond the boundary of the United States. Uh, um, but even you know, cli direct climate risk, damage risk, is already appearing, especially for the reinsurance firms. And having a major effect on uh, on insurance pricing, and then uh, this issue of stranded carbon is probably somewhere around twenty trillion dollars of strand. What will ultimately be stranded carbon in the world? We can't burn all the carbon. We can't even burn uh, a fraction of what's left, and keep ourselves within anything like a livable temperature on this planet. Uh, and that hasn't been priced into. Uh, the stock market values of the, big, of the majors, for example, yet. And it will be at some point. Uh, and uh, uh, these are sleeping issues that will become increasingly powerful in the next uh, 10 to 20 years. So just very quickly, uh, just to give you a sense for how rapidly things are changing, uh, just a few slides. I pruned a lot out. I have whole bunch of stuff, really fascinating stuff on this. But we hit, last August, we hit a total global electric vehicle fleet of 4 million. Uh, and we're at 5 million already now. So that's, that's it. I think that you're, you're adding, oh, what is it? I think you're adding a, a million. I think we're actually close to 6 million now because we're adding a million about every eight weeks. To the, to the global fleet. You extrapolate that out, we're at 100 million by 2028 or something like that on that growth curve. The total global passenger fleet is about a billion vehicles. Okay? So that's a significant chunk of the global passenger fleet. Uh, and uh, here, Bloomberg, and this is, a, I still think, every time I turn around, Bloomberg is revising these figures up. Uh, yesterday, I was looking at this. They'd gone from 41 by 2040, 41 million EV sales, uh, EV vehicles, electric vehicle sales in uh, 2040, and now they're up to 60 million. That would be about 50% of projected sales at that point. I, I, here's, here's, you can, you can, I'll come back in 2040, okay? And we can meet again. I don't think people will be selling ICEs then, internal combustion engines. The, that is a technology that's been around for 120 years, and we are in the last decades of that technology. But as soon as, as soon as the range problems are solved and the prices come down, and the prices are coming down very fast in these vehicles, people are going to love them. They don't break. They're quiet. They're cheap to run. And they've got great power off the line. They're actually fun to drive. Uh, so so this, is a, this is a major change in our technological uh, <laughs> 
the profile of our core technologies. This is, what, this is a GPT transition just there in electric vehicles alone. So let me talk a little bit in closing about the issue of license uh, and the normative dimension. This will bring me back to the question of growth because I think fundamentally all this stuff is a moral challenge. I think that's, that's where we end up. Uh, and uh, Sol and I were talking uh, just before the presentation about, um, about moving beyond the kind of rational utility maximizing person and firm idea uh, paradigm that dominates within uh, the economics profession and perhaps still in many respects within business schools. Uh, I think we need to be much more explicit about the normative challenges we're facing here. And I think this also relates directly to the issue of growth. Because growth, there are lots of people out there, and I associate with a lot of these folks who think, well, we've got to get rid of growth. Well, the trouble is growth does a lot of really good things for us. Uh, we, we, we pay off our debts through, uh, through growth, or we make them smaller because we grow out of them. Uh, they're very strong argument by people like Benjamin Friedman at Harvard who suggests that there's a strong correlation between social and political freedoms and economic growth uh, up to about $15,000, 10 to $15,000 a year per capita income. There's a strong correlation between growth and happiness. That means three quarters of the world's population needs growth because they're below that threshold. Uh, and we know from this, the last century that when you lose growth, you get some really nasty social stuff happening and social breakdown and rise in unemployment and you get things like uh, the Second World War, the rise of Nazism and the Holocaust. And, and, uh, and so growth, growth is important, but the problem is it doesn't lead to a clean environment. And this idea of the environmental Kuznets curve is, uh, is I think being quite decisively rebutted by empirical evidence. It's now 25 years, basically closing in on 25 years when this uh, seminal article came out, which made the argument for the environmental Kuznets curve by Grossman and Kruger. Uh, and the argument, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is basically that there's this inverted U relationship between GDP per capita and uh, level of environmental degradation. And what you do is you make, you make people really wealthy and the environmental damage comes down because people start demanding environmental damage, uh, environmental protection because they're, they now don't have to worry so much about survival. And they, they've got some, they turn around to their politicians and leaders and elites and say, you fix these environmental problems because they're making us sick and they're threatening our future. Uh, and also, as economies get wealthier, they have a lot of resources to throw at the environmental problems to fix them through end of pipe pollution controls, for example. Well, unfortunately, it's a great idea and there's some evidence for it. And the best evidence is probably sulfur dioxide in the United States. It looks like, kind of looks like an inverted U. Uh, but when you do the cross-national comparisons for, for uh, in this case, sulfur dioxide, I don't see, so this is, this is a, across all those different countries. Uh, uh, I don't see an inverted U relationship there. And boy, when you look at CO2 emissions, any inverted U there. So uh, there was a very interesting debate that's appeared in sort of the gray literature just in the last few weeks. I don't know if any of you have seen this. This is coming out of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Uh, between these folks, Schroeder and Storm, looking at basically, can we grow our way out of these problems? And, and is, there, is, is there any validity? Could there be any validity to uh, inverted U environmental Kuznets curve relationship in the future? Uh, and uh, or, or is growth, does growth inevitably lead to environmental damage? And, uh, and this paper makes the argument that this idea of decoupling growth from environmental damage, an EKC idea, environmental Kuznets idea, idea is, uh, is, is probably not supported by the empirical evidence and the theoretical evidence. So I'll just read these highlights. These folks say, decoupling is regarded as viable in global and natural policy discourses uh, in the Paris Agreement and claim to be already happening in real time. Witness the recent declines in territorial CO2 emissions in a group of more than 20 economies. 
However, some scholars argue that radical decarbonization will not be possible while increasing the size of the economy. And then just two sentences from the middle of the paper. Here they say, uh, where does that sentence start? Without a concerted global policy shift to deep decarbonization, a rapid transition to renewable energy sources, structural change in production, consumption and transportation, and a transformation of finance, the decoupling will not even come close to what is needed. This is after their analysis. Uh, the key insight is that marginal incremental improvements in energy and carbon efficiency cannot do the job. And what is needed is a structural transformation and, and establishment economics lacks the instruments and approaches to, an exact, uh, to analyze exactly this. Um, that's a pretty radical statement. So they're saying basically that growth and environmental protection are incompatible, right? Under any plausible scenarios for growth in the future. Now, this fellow responds, Michael Grubb, or Grubb, he probably pronounces his name, uh, and he says, uh, drawing on people like Paul Romer and endogenous growth theory, and I worked on endogenous growth theory a number of years ago, so I'm, I'm receptive to this argument. He says, basically, um, in, in sum, if you develop new technologies in niches, as we've seen with PV and wind, these things can explode very fast and change and change the profile of production and the profile of energy consumption uh, much faster than the two other authors have assumed in their work. I would recommend these papers as four of them, and I can send them to you if you like, but it's a, it's a spectacularly interesting conversation and directly relevant to the challenge we face. You see, I, tend to, I, I think the issue of growth is fundamental and central, and I don't know what the answer to these questions what the answers are. Uh, it's, it's, it is a conundrum. Um, um, and it has this fundamental normal, normative characteristic to it because we need growth for these normatively good things that I pointed to before. And yet it seems to be destroying something that is very important for those normatively good things to be possible, our natural environment. Uh, I think that uh, the other part of this normative frame that is important is recognizing that we're all on this planet together. And it's a really small place now. So this is Vancouver this past summer. And that stuff, as you can see from these satellite photographs, that smoke there you can see in the, the accentuated color spread all across the Northern Hemisphere. And it was thick in places too. It was almost as, as thick for some periods of time in the east in the Atlantic provinces as it was in Vancouver, right? And it's scaring people because it affects their health. I think there was an article in the Times calling this just yesterday talking about the health implications of the smoke uh, for people and how bad it is for them, right? And this is a galvanizing people all over the planet, this kind of stuff. There's a, there's a message there. I use a lifeboat metaphor, which is a very common metaphor, of course. You know, we're a lifeboat, we're all in this lifeboat on the stormy, stormy sea. It's dark and there's leaks at one end of the boat. And we're all kind of responsible for making those leaks, but some of, them are, some of us are more responsible than others. And, uh, and the people who are furthest from the leaks uh, think that maybe they can save themselves, you know, by walling themselves off from the, the end of the boat that's going lower and lower in the water, or maybe tossing a few people overboard, right? Uh, which we know has happened in the past. But the bottom line is, when the boat sinks, the people at the high end of the boat go down only a little bit later. They drown, they die only a little bit later than the ones at the low end of the boat. So that's really where we are right now. Uh, and I think this, this common fate leads to kind of commitments of these kinds, and these are what I'll stress in my book. Uh, the, that, that what we need to tell people is possible in the future still. And I think this is a message that, can, that needs to go forward from business schools and management schools and from the academy more generally, is that there is still in this future that we define, which may have a radically different approach to whatever we call growth, which is a central research and empirical question right now. What's that going to look like? It can still provide opportunity which is a room, I think of it as elbow room for people to flourish, people to, to develop their talents and their agency and possibilities for themselves and their family. Security, because people are scared. Safety from threat, because they see these threats coming from every direction. And then really fundamentally, and this in many, many respects is the thing that economists have the most trouble dealing with, is bringing into the center of our discourse 
commitments to fairness. And we can think about how that's going to look, whether it's utilitarian or deontological, you know, to what extent we use kind of a Rawlsian, I'm, I'm kind of like a Rawlsian approach. I think it's, it's a persuasive argument. But this needs to be much more explicitly at the center of the message that we take forward. Because otherwise, that anger will increase. And then we'll just, we'll all throttle each other as the boat's going down. Okay, thank you. Oh, just to remind us. <laughs> where we are. <laughs> that's actually not the, that's not the Apollo 8 shot. The Apollo 8 shot, I think, is, it's the moonrise, right? And then they took some shots of Africa and stuff, but I think this is a, this is maybe a geostationary satellite shot. Some questions? Yes. Thomas, um, I think that you make a strong argument of this is a we problem. But unfortunately, we live in a us versus them world. Yep. And in a world where the political institutions, national and international, are seemingly at least. Um, influenced by not the majority of people, but by a small minority. Powerful and influential, but minority. So how can we turn this war around to make it a war, a we war? And how we as a business school can contribute to the solution? So I don't have a magic answer to this, right? Uh, I. I I'm not entirely convinced that we live in a world of us and them. So my, one of my central research projects over decades has been the study of human conflict. And I'm just about to come out with a paper that applies complex systems approaches to the psychology of dehumanization. The, the title of the paper is Catastrophic Dehumanization. And it develops a model for how you can flip from recognizing other people as members of your own group to not thinking of them as even human, and then you can kill them. Right. So, so this, is a, this has been a central concern, these we-they dynamics. The title of my dissertation at MIT was We and They. It's a theory of social conflict. So, so this, I've, been, I've been in the midst of this for, for decades. Now, I would say we got to remember, and this is a point that people like Steven Pinker and others make, but it's an important point. Uh, George Monbiot made it, made it in his recent book, Out of the Wreckage. Human beings are fundamentally socially, social and cooperative creatures. Like 99.9999% of the time, we get along. And we do all kinds of cooperative things together to produce essentially positive sum outcomes in what could otherwise be uh, uh, you know, in prisoners' dilemmas type situations. Right? We, we find the win-wins all the time. And uh, we have enormous capacity for empathy, enormous capacity for altruism. We're wired with mirror neurons and stuff like that. On the other hand, when fear and anger start to take hold, we have this capacity, which by the way, I think is probably evolutionarily wired into us. We have this capacity to shut off our empathy. We have the capacity to shut off our, our concern about others. We have to, because you know, when we were hominids, if, if you, you couldn't start saying, as people, the, other, the other tribe was coming over the hill with their clubs, you couldn't start saying, well, geez, you know, what's the world look like from their perspective? You know? <laughs> you, instead, you just had to say, OK, I'm going to be ready to kill them. Right? So, so what came with consciousness was the cap capacity to shut off the ability to see into the minds of others and think of them as like us. So, so here's my answer, the best answer I can give you at this point, and it's the closing of my book. Human beings have never been in the situation they're in now on this planet, right? It's possible, this is sui generis, it's possible just possible, and I would say 20%. I'd say 80% chances we're going to be in a Mad Max world where we're, where we're throttling each other in the sinking lifeboat, OK? But there's still a 20% chance, which is a substantial chance, and I'm willing to bet the future of my kids on it, right? A 20% chance that because this is a new situation, there is a possibility for kind of flips in people's identities and understanding sufficient proportion of the human population, which, by the way, you don't need, you don't need half. You don't need 40%. You get 20% of the human population thinking in a different way about these things in terms of a shared fate understanding with, you know, grounded in some, some kind of 
Habermasian or Rawlsian notion of justice crudely thought out, not some coherent global ideology, but just a change in the zeitgeist, then you could move in a really different direction. But we're still going to lose the coral reefs, and we're still going to have a hell of a, a lot of trouble feeding ourselves later this century. But, but I keep coming back to the fact that this is different, right? Because this palpable sense that we're in this environment is really small, and we can see how we're wrecking it. And, and the people who say, let's retreat behind our barriers, build the walls, get ready to fight, they don't have an end game. They don't tell us where we're going to be a century from now or even 50 years from now, except fighting and dying ultimately with everybody else. That doesn't look very positive. So it's possible there's that 20% in there somewhere, and I'm willing to gamble on it. It's enough to hope for. It's not a terribly satisfying answer, but, but and, and, and I accept that. But you see, the worst thing that can happen right now, the worst thing for all the people who are well-intentioned in this world is to believe that it's game over. And it's amazing how often that's happening. I don't know if you're experiencing this, but depression rates are starting to skyrocket in, in, among, among uh, graduate students who are, who are working in anything related to this stuff. Young women are starting to say, I'm not going to have children. That's, a, that's an advanced signal of, of uh, you know, there are groups that have developed all over, all over the United States of, of, uh, of women in childbearing years who are, who are meeting to talk about not having children. I said, it's astonishing. Right? So, so the worst thing that can happen is we capitulate to that stuff. So we have to keep some possibility there. And I think we start with the normative frame and, and try to make it a positive thing. I mean, this may be, and the last point I'll make, this may be, in a sense, the ultimate maturation of our species. So we're behaving like adolescents. So we think we're invulnerable and we're trashing the house. <laughs> right? And, and, and so, so maybe we're going we're gonna to realize after we trash the house for a while that this is the only place we can live. And we got to grow up. And then the big hero project for future centuries would be rebuilding nature. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, just a quick clarification. Uh, the reference to fairness under Rawls? Rawls, W-R-A-W-L-S. So this is John Rawls. John, right? Uh, the Harvard philosopher. He, he had a... <clears throat> You have to make a decision about what your sort of analytical basis is for your principles of fairness and justice. And fairness and justice are not really the same thing. But I, I, I use fairness in, when my, in my conversations because people have, they have a more intuitive sense for what fairness is. You know, all children have a sense for what fairness is. So, so uh, John Rawls, um, in his book Theory of Justice, laid out some sort of basic analytical principles by which societies could organize themselves to be just. And uh, I'm not going to elaborate on those principles. There are two of them. There, does anybody, yeah, does anybody recall what they are? There's the two. One, one is that, and the most important one is that any change in the distribution of resources has to benefit the least well off in the system. And the critical thing, and this is a really powerful insight, a really powerful insight, he calls it the, uh, the original position. You make your decisions about the rules of justice or fairness in your society without knowing where you're going to be in that society when those rules are implemented. And he says, OK, if, if you, so we don't know whether we're going to be living in Afghanistan or Bangladesh or in Manhattan, and what our socioeconomic status is there. And he says that if you, if you start from that original position, and you assume that, that you have no power or knowledge to influence your future situation, then you are almost inexorably left, led to these two, um, two principles that he specifies to organize the distribution. In particular, it's a distributional theory of justice, so to organize the distribution of, of goods within the system. So I, I think, and, and so it's interesting. This is not to say anything. How many people here know John Rawls? That's very interesting. That is really interesting. How many people here know the basic differences between virtue ethics, deontological ethics, and utilitarian ethics? OK, so it's a little bit better. OK? So, so and, and, and this is not to put anybody down, but most philosophers and ethicists would say that John Rawls was the greatest philosopher of justice in the 20th century. That should be in business schools, right? 
I, I, I think, I think not, just the way that, that political scientists should be learning a lot of the stuff that you're teaching, right? The, these silos, these divisions are just terrible for us. Uh, can, I, can I just comment on that? Yes. Since you are not, um, you haven't worked in a business school. No, I have no. Um, <laughs> We constantly face the, our stakeholders uh, are constantly uh, asking us to be relevant. <coughs> to be relevant. Relevant. Yes. What that means in their minds is that we have to create workers, not citizens. Uh, and that's why the I moment we start talking about ethics and morality in classes, even the students themselves as being, you know, socialized in their families in that way, they react and say, why are you teaching me morals? Uh, I'm coming here to get jobs. So that's a really interesting question. I don't have an answer to because I, and I, I see the situation, right? And, and I completely see the situation. There's this huge sorting process as people stream themselves into career paths and academic paths. And I see a certain kind of student, and you guys see a different kind of student. And I, this is a real challenge. But I, I don't think the solution is leaving the ethical and moral stuff to the side. And I, I know that my soul thinks exactly the same thing. We were talking about this before. Before I shouldn't be speaking for you. Uh, <laughs> but we were talking about this beforehand. I, it's, just, it, it's just, you know, the world is really, it's, it's really different. It's changing fast, and it's getting really dangerous. And in those circumstances, uh, you have to have some pretty basic conversations about where you're going. And that's, it, that's normative. What do you value? And it comes right down to, so, so you know, this century, we're, we're evolving from, you know, a sustainability dis discourse that started with Eleanor Ostrom, not Eleanor Ostrom, um, our, um, uh, uh, sorry, the, the uh, uh, Prime Minister of Sweden, who, uh, who, Brundtland Commission, thank you. Yes, Brundtland Commission. So that, say, what was that, 78 or something like that, 82. Uh, the concept of sustainability was introduced. Um, Jim McNeil, actually a Canadian, was instrumental in that, wrote most of uh, our, it was our common future, right? Uh, so that's sustainability discourse, and it's still hear it a lot in mainstream policy and economics and business circles. Uh, you're starting to see the emergence substantially of what you could call a resilience de discourse, which is a re reaction to the sense that we're getting all these shocks, so we need to have the capacity to bounce back from those shocks and be resilient, uh, which is a particular understanding of resilience, it's quite a conservative understanding of resilience is a bounce back notion instead of bounce forward to something new, which is another question. But I think what we will see emerge for, out of both the sustainability and resilience discourses is what you would call a triage discourse. Okay, and the first triage questions are going to revolve around which biota we're going to we're going to leave leave behind. We're going to lose, and we're already doing that. I mean, there's some megafauna like the orcas that we talk about a lot, but there's an awful lot of stuff, including things like pollinators, we aren't talking about. We, you know, the, the monarchs, you know, the eastern monarchs seem to be okay. It looks like the western monarch populations are just about gone now, but this stuff just doesn't get much attention. We get some attention on the megafaunas, but not on a lot of the other stuff. So, but then, you know, we're going to be, in the middle of the century, we're going to be starting to triage geographic regions. What coastal zones are we going to give up? Uh, what areas are, are going to, we can't supply, have sufficient water, for instance, for instance, potentially the southwest of the United States. So we're going to have to reduce populations in those regions. And towards the end of the century, if we keep down that path, going down that path, we're going to be triaging populations. And that's when we're in the boat and we're trying to wall it off and we're saying, well, those folks, they're on their own. Now, if those aren't moral questions, and, and as long as we stay within a strictly utilitarian calculus, we end up in that kind of triage mindset, and we slide down that, that moral slope towards ultimately triaging people, not just places and other species. Yeah. So I'm glad we have three more hours to discuss this. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, there's a lot to be explored here. Um, thank you so much for this vast perspective on the world um, and on where we are going and where we could be going. I think that 20% of where we could be going is something we have to hold on to fast. 
Because and it gets we smaller know that, we go out if we don't do anything. Yes, because we know that helplessness, a sense of helplessness, is directly linked to depression, and depression means not doing anything and being miserable in the process. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, or, or you can you can uh, party, which I think is another alternative. <laughs> party. That takes a lot of drugs. Yeah, <laughs> and I think I think increasing numbers of people will uh, disappear into um, virtual fantasy lands. So on the theme of fantasy, <laughs> thank you for raising that. I was thinking, as you were wrapping this up, what I what really really jumped out at me was okay. Let me back up for one second. We're in a strategic planning process or ramping up to that, which is always a tremendous opportunity to make some deliberate and joint decisions on who we want to be, what we want to do, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, in that strategic planning, over the past decade or more, innovation, our pride in our ability to be innovative has been really strong yep. and, and it's something that we have really cultivated. So back to the fantasy piece. I think what I'm hearing you say is that we need to engage our imagination in a whole new deliberate way, <coughs> power collectively. And so if I bring that down to the business school, to us, Gustafson Business School. I'm wondering if you have some suggestions, maybe now or maybe in the next three hours or years, on how we could do that. How can we build that imagination yeah. in a positive way? And I think it picks well, I think it goes right over to this question here. Yeah. Yeah. So is it Ricardo? Yeah. So um, yeah, so innovation. So I, uh, you know, my first big trade book was The Ingenuity Gap, and, and Paul Romer actually helped me a lot with the argument in that, and because it's, it's centered on endogenous growth theory a lot. So I've looked closely at, at economic theories of innovation, solo residual, stuff like that. And um, we tend to think of innovation still, I mean, that book came out 20 years ago, but we still tend to think of innovation as mostly about technology. Uh, but really, the, 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 we, need, we need good technologies. I mean, it would be great to have test tube beef, right? Uh, we could have huge impacts on methane output and carbon output in the world if, if we could produce steak out of, out of uh, vats that was as good as regular steak, right? It would be terrific. And the, 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 the folks doing the, this work are really close to some very impressive developments there. So, so I'm all for technical innovation. We need better batteries and all the stuff it was talking about. But really where we need the innovation is on the social side. I made this distinction in my book between social ingenuity and technical ingenuity. We need, we need where we fall back, and you know, I blame my field, political science, for that as much as anybody else, is, is in the breakthrough ideas on the, on the social side, right? But I think, and I think this may be where you're going, Monica, the, 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 um, it's more than just new kinds of institutions because it goes to what we've just been talking about. The institutions need to sit in a, a normative context. They need to be for something. They need, to be, they, need to, they need to give people a sense of positive purpose in their lives, which, which, which means uh, they have to have an... Uh, a kind of ideological surround that has a, a clearly articulated normative frame, right? And I think, I think one of the reasons we struggle so much with institutional innovation and social innovation is because we regard a lot of these questions as kind of matters of private, private decision making. A lot of these normative and moral questions are within liberal society are regarded as things that, that as much as possible should be left to the individual. And we tend not to have conversations about them. And so we don't, do, we don't exercise our imaginations in those areas. Right. Um, so I don't know whether Gustafson, I, I, just as an aside, I should say that I think I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, myself and my family will move back to Vancouver Island in the, in the not too distant future. And one of the reasons, besides the fact that this is my home uh, and I feel deeply rooted here, 
and my kids love it here. But really, also, I think some of the, in, the innovations that are happening socially on Vancouver Island are extremely interesting, and the political changes that are happening here. Kind of a vanguard of some conversations, uh, in some ways, at the leading edge of conversations, who would have thought, on Vancouver Island, in North America, uh, even, even around the world. And so there may be an opportunity here for Gustafson to do some innovative stuff on this moral imagination in the area of of business. I mean, the idea that this is somehow a morally neutral activity is absurd. We all know that's absurd, that, that business is a morally neutral activity. And, and, and now, it's not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not with Nor, you know, uh, Naomi Klein and company and suggest that the problem is capitalism. I'm a varieties of capitalism guy. And there are different normative orientations to markets and to the institutions that support markets and to the cap capitalist enterprise enterprises and and we need to, because what will happen if we don't have this conversation then the anti-capitalists will win because we don't offer any alternatives and i'm speaking sort of broadly now being part of your community more generally because we don't offer the alternatives that that actually speak to the moral challenges we're facing and if we don't then the Abby Lewis's and Naomi Klein's will be, will be the, the reasonable folks on the other side. The unreasonable will look a lot more like Lenin, right? So, so I, we have a real challenge here, and it's, it's gotta, it's, it's, we've got to engage these issues. And if the students don't like it, then what you do is you make it part of the selling, the selling uh, features of the school, of what we're doing in Victoria because we're doing something right at the leading edge. This isn't some sort of backwater that's sort of stuck on the side of the continent. It's actually turning out that there's enormous creativity here in this area. And by the way, I think the indigenous turn can be part of that because that's being a complexity guy, I really like having lots of ideas in the mix and getting different ideas into the mix can create new things that you haven't seen before. That's where most innovation comes from, right? Combinatorial, things that haven't been connected together before. So, so that can be, you know, Gustafson could be kind of crucible for this kind of thing. I'm not sure exactly what that would look like in, ter in curricular terms, but it, it seems to me that it could be part of the value added or the comparative advantage of the school. It just make it front and center. Yeah. We used a little bit of that in our, um, in our business and sustainability course. We start talking about different structures like, um, Benefit corporations and the three C's, yeah. which are yeah. the exactly. inversion of that. Yeah. But you're talking about getting away from structures or going beyond. No, I think these. I think these are very interesting developments. I, I, you know, they're not. They, they're feasible, but not enough. But better to have something that's at least feasible. I, so I think these these institutional developments are very interesting. Um, but I think. And, and I'm, I'm out of my depth at this point because I don't know, for instance, the conversations that are going on about some of these normative questions, moral questions within, uh, within the management and business communities. And I'm sure, I know they're there, right? So how do you push the boundaries on that? How do you introduce things without alienating your, your students and your stakeholders who, after all, pay the bills, right? Well, it's sort of like there's a divide, though, because you see organizations like Ben and Jerry's becoming a benefit corporation and they're being bought up by Unilever because they see the value of that. Well, oh, Unilever, oh, Unilever is actually a fairly progressive corporation in mm -hmm. all these areas. Right, but they are massive and huge. So you yeah. can't just say, well, this is a niche thing or it's just for small businesses or something because that's... that's well, and, and, and good in some sense because Unilever... I mean, there's been some interesting articles about the company recently that they supposedly leaving all kinds of profit on the, on the table because they are, are making these more socially, normatively progressive decisions. And but they're very straight up with their, their shareholders about yeah. that. And, and the share saying, and you know, this is who we want to be. Yeah, so and that's very interesting. And they're, not, and, they're not, and, and, they're not, and they're not suffering. I don't know where they are right now in terms of stock value and stuff like that. But uh, they're doing okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay is okay. Maybe we should have Yeah, yeah. So, so there's that piece. And then there's the so, so part of, part of the curriculum, from a curriculum point of view, you take these cases, you examine them, and right. see how they work, yeah. and, and figure out if, to what extent those patterns can be tweaked to make them even more successful. I mean, BP tried to be beyond petroleum for a while, and it was a disaster. And, and so there's an interesting anti-case study 
But that would actually be a terrifically. Shell might be interesting as well because they're divesting themselves of you know, things like gas stations and they're buying all this green energy thing. Yeah. But they have people have blinders on about what Shell is and. Right. And they've also, for decades, done the best scenario analysis and some of the best scenario analysis in the world, right? So Shell is a very interesting company, and it's, it emerges from, a, I think, to a certain extent, a Dutch ethic and a Dutch, a Dutch culture. And, and so I think there's enough variation in sort of the var varieties of capitalism paradigm here to do some really interesting coursework and course development. Uh, so, I mean, and with your students, you'd say, we're not telling you here what to do, but there's this variation out here. And you can recognize that if your inclinations take you towards, towards uh, a more normatively oriented approach, there are these corporations that are doing very well doing that, right? And then I think there's some broader questions too about the large, and this would be more in my, my area, about larger governance structures, the institutional environments, uh, limited liability laws, and all kinds of things, property rights that surround the context that surrounds and makes and, and enables longer time horizon because it all comes down to longer time horizons, lower discount rates, uh, and and uh, uh, extending the shadow of the future into the present, uh, and how you do that institutionally. It, it, it's an enormous challenge, but I don't see I don't see the kinds of conversations we need about that in uh, the academic world. Uh, at, at the moment, but that may be because I'm just largely misinformed. But I don't don't think so. I'm not. Uh, just saying we teach that we have a lot of course, so presumably we could catch on, or or bring these sorts so of. So I'm very interested. I'm very interested in relatively small tweaks that could have a huge influence, uh, in 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 aspects, for instance, of IP, IPR, law, other things that could could potentially shift incentives very powerfully to produce new corporate forms and new corporate activities. So, so that is where, from a research point of view, that's where I would want to invest a lot of time. The high leverage intervention. Right. Yeah. So my question was along this varieties of capitalism. In, in your view, is there a variety out there, whether it be the Scandinavian model or to use a different term, a world view that is better aligned with the direction that you think we and I don't have a clear answer to that question. But I do think that there's an enormous landscape we haven't, haven't properly explored yet of possibilities. I think, I think human societies tend to get trapped into small parts of the landscape of possibilities. And then they, can't, and then they think that's all that's real. So I think that there's an enormous, they're, they're, I, I'm absolutely convinced. For, in the area where I work is on ideological change, right? An ideological possibility. And you know, we've, We've uh, elaborated what's called in complexity circles a state space model, in this case of ideological possibility. So basically, we've identified a series of dimensions that characterize typical ideological. And, and we're using ideology, ideology in, a, in a scholarly sense here as a, as a belief system about uh, appropriate political and economic organization. Right, and so we've we've identified we've identified now 16, 15 or sixteen dimensions, on which uh, pretty well all ideologies vary and are situ situate themselves. Each you can sort of characterize as a question. One might be is is uh, uh, is the ideology oriented towards the future or the past? Another one is uh, is the does the ideology promote change or resist change? Very simple questions like that. So you create this space. And even with a relatively crude number of positions on each of those dimensions, you're up into the 60 billion different possibilities of, of ideological attitudes, right? And, and yet human societies cluster their basins of attraction where we cluster, and they get reinforced and deepened because of vested interests and institutional sclerosis, right? So, so I, I, I'm absolutely certain that the same has happened with capitalism. There's enormous path dependency in these processes. There's certain decisions that are made early on about things like IPRs and property rights and about, about uh, uh, liability that, that channel, channel uh, institutions in a certain direction and then they get reinforced because you get these powerful uh, incumbent vested interests settling into place. 
So, so somehow we've got to break out of these blinders and see what other possibilities. And then, of course, the question is trying to find the migration pathways through that state space from one place to another. That's the real challenge. So my answer is I don't know. It, but I would be absolutely astonished if everything that's possible we've already discovered. I, 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 would, I would bet my life that's not the case. Now, that may not mean that what we haven't discovered is going to be good for the global environment, but there's a chance it is. Look, here's the thing. The reason I'm gung-ho on markets, and to a somewhat lesser extent, you know, depending on how you define capitalism, on capitalism, the reason I am is because these are the most innovative systems humankind has ever, humankind has ever developed. It's astonishing. I'm not a, I, I, I worked in the oil industry, right? I worked in the oil patch in Alberta. And I know, I know how to get oil out of the ground. I was, you know, worked in drilling rigs and stuff like that. And, uh, and you know, there was about 10 years ago, everybody was on the peak oil bandwagon, and nobody saw hydrofracking come along. And now, not only did they start hydrofracking, but they'd driven down the cost through innovation. It's just astonishing how capitalism innovates. You know, and now, now there are a lot of these in the, uh, uh, is the Permian Basin in, uh, in Texas? There are a lot of drillers that, that can make a profit at 30 bucks a barrel with hydrofracking and shale. It's terrible for this, but boy, you just got to be, you've just, you've just got to tip your hat to the way these folks innovate. They did it because it was the only way they could survive, because oil prices were, dro were, were dropping and, and all kinds of hydrofracking companies were going out of business and there were a number of minor, minor companies that were able to hang on and they figured, okay, how can we make a profit at $40 a barrel oil? And they did it. So, so what we want to turn, we want to turn, this is why I'm a big fan of carbon pricing, we want to turn that innovative engine in the direction of solving these problems and just let it rip. So we, we, the, I have had debates with Abby Lewis on, uh, on uh, the Leap Manifesto, and I just think they're so wrong about this. This is not a problem of the big C. They get up and say, it's a big C, it's all about capitalism. This is, that's a truly pernicious argument. Yeah. You talk about your focus on ideological change, and a lot of the content of this presentation focuses on changing our way of thinking. Yeah. Um, to bring it down to the individual level, how has it affected how you live your life in terms of what you do every day, and also your way of thinking about yourself in terms of your transforming your uh, means of being? How you think it's, it, you know, it, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that happens right now. I have two houses, which is just can't believe it, you know, because I, we didn't want it to, to, uh, to sell the house in, in Machosan when my dad passed away. And, uh, and, you know, the question was then, you know, what can we do? I mean, there's very practical questions about how we're reduce, reducing your footprint. And one of the real incentives to come out here is I can get an electric vehicle, you know, and uh, because they actually don't work in, good, in the kind of snow we get in Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Uh, so I think it comes down to lots of very practical decisions like that. I'd like to, I'd like to see how close to carbon zero carbon we can get as a family. Um, but I think the bigger question is is uh, is what do we tell our kids? And that's the thing that I struggle with. That's why I'm writing this book, right? So so both Kate Kate's ten and Ben's thirteen, and they they're both they know that both can see they were here for the smoke events last summer. We don't lie to them what's going on. We don't spend a lot of time talking about climate change, but they, they, they pick it up. It's awful for them. They're scared. They would be scared even if they didn't have two greeny parents, <laughs> right? Because they can see this stuff, right? They can see the change. There's no, there's not much snow in my part of Ontario, our part of Ontario anymore. You can't have a skating rink outside. We used to make, make skating rinks outside the house. No more skating rinks. You don't get out for cross-country skiing. It's raining in January. They see it within their, little, their short lives. They see the change already. I don't know. Well, I mean, I'm kind of developing an argument in my book about, about what to tell our children, but that's the really big challenge. You know? And I, I, it's, it's a deeply distressing thing. So, so, so you have to, and it sounds corny, but you have to give them some hope. You have to give them a sense of purpose and possibility in this world. That's, that's the central thing. And so that, and I think, and it you know, gets directly to your point, I think, I think you, you, we're, we're all waist deep in hypocrisy, but maybe if we can be knee deep, that would be better, right? So you have to actually kind of walk the, walk the talk to a certain extent. And you know, I, we hope to do that as a family.
and uh, and and it takes a lot of self-examination about not only the practices, consu consumption practices, but also what kind of career path you go on, and also what kinds of social relations you cultivate. The kind of world, I guess the last point I'll make, Sol, the kind of world we're talking about will probably be, in some respects, when you take a deep breath, a somewhat more communitarian world. Because there are gonna be a lot of trade-offs for the community here. It, it, and and I, the paradigm and the ethic that business schools tend to operate in is very individualistic. And, and I think that's, a, that's something that we have to confront pretty directly. We, when we start talking about we and other people in the lifeboat, it means that sometimes you might actually have to, there might be some internal transfers of opportunity and possibility and even wealth in the system. And that's something that, uh, that I know uh, a lot of e economists and business school folks have trouble, trouble talking about. Right? So when then we are back sort of in the normative questions. And I think that's, uh, you know, there are choices about then very practical sense at the family level about how much you're involved in your community, how much you're contributing to, to the common wheel. I think we're going to have to cut the short, not because we're running out of material, but we're just running out of time. Uh, Thomas, this has been fascinating. Thank you for sharing this. And the timing for us is really profound. And your comments about we have to be thinking about what is mission and purpose and what are we trying to achieve. And it does require a fundamental evaluation or reevaluation of our value system. So thank you for helping to share that. We look forward to the fact that you will be in Victoria yeah. soon, and we can continue to engage in these discussions and think about, again, part of what's involved is thinking about new partnerships, new, new ways of combining worldviews, looking at the world differently, which is a big part of what we're trying to do. So on behalf of all our colleagues, thank you very much. For